Uh, thank you very much. Um, let's make sure I know how to advance these slides before anything else happens. Um, one of the things that I'd like to start with is saying, I write virtually every day, and this is in response to the first presentation, but I love reading every day. There's not a day that goes by that I don't read. And I think that's an important thing that the first speaker talked about. We focus so much in terms of our evaluations on how well students read or write, but not enough on whether they want to read or write and whether that becomes part of their life. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by sharing, you know, I love writing, so obviously I'm gonna share something students wrote. And the first one, I wish this was the real world. I have a dog. I have a, a, a small dog that I truly love. And I ran across this, Pavlov studied the salvation of dogs. One letter, the world changes. <laughs> It's a completely different universe. Um, the second one, you know, it's really not a writing problem, it's a math problem, but this kid could use some help in terms of feedback. Galileo was half Italian, one half French, and one half English, and the kid went on to say he was very large. <laughs> so I guess so. Um, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about how we can help students what we can do as teachers that has an evidence base around it to be better writers. And I would also say, given what Dominique said earlier, not only better writers, but better readers, because the two go hand in hand. They really can't uh, be disconnected. The other thing I'd like to start off with saying is when we look around the world, not just England, not just the United States, what we see is that there are some teachers and some schools that do a phenomenal job of teaching kids to write. But at least in terms of the evidence that we've collected from multiple countries, what we see is that kids don't write very much in school and there's not very much time devoted to its instruction. And that's unfortunate. So what I'd like to do is share with you, and I'm gonna capsulize it in a minute in five words and then talk a little bit about each of these evidence-based practices or recommendations for writing. And then they'll also include some evidence-based practices. So, you know, then the question is, what evidence? So what we tried to do is we tried to draw broadly in terms of making this rec these recommendations. We looked at meta-analysis and we've conducted quite a few of these, taking a look at kind of randomized control trials and quasi-experiments to figure out what we could say. We also took a look at single case design studies, which you may or may not be familiar with, and I really don't have the time to go into, but they're another quantitative method for taking a look at change, but they often don't involve statistics. And then we also looked at, or conducted a metasynthesis of instructional procedures that exceptional literacy teachers use. Now, I present all three of these. One, I'm an academic, so of course I like to talk about my evidence and where it came from. But what was remarkable to us is how these things lined up. We saw exceptional teachers using the same procedures that we saw effective in these large group studies and these smaller case studies that had a control condition in, in them, which makes me a lot more confident about what I can say to you. So in terms of thinking about evidence-based practices, the five takeaways from this are write, teach, support, connect, and create. And of course, a couple of these are a little bit easier to understand uh, without other things like write, but we'll take a look at each of these in turn. And one of the things that you'll see is that there's a percentile point jump here. So when you engage students in more writing, this is about 45 minutes a week, not a lot. You have a 12 percentile point jump and the quality of their writing. And the things I'm gonna be talking about are improvements in quality of writing. If I'm not talking about that, I'll say so. What's not on here is there's also a jump in their reading comprehension. So you engage students in more writing, they become better writers, and they become better readers, okay? That's an important thing, and we're not seeing a lot of that going on. 
Now, what are some of the things that we might be talking about in terms of this? We're talking about extended opportunities for writing. So when we interview and we've surveyed teachers uh, nationally and internationally, what we find is that mostly what they're doing are small writing activities. There's nothing wrong with that, and they often serve a very real purpose for teachers. But what we're not seeing is kids having the opportunity to write on a piece over an extended period of time. Writing for real audiences. You know who the audience is as far as most kids are concerned. It's the teacher. I was a former teacher, so I know this you know, firsthand. So we want to make sure kids are writing for real purposes and for real reasons. And this is something we saw exceptional teachers doing quite frequently. We want to engage kids in cycles of planning, translating, and reviewing or revising. Now, that doesn't mean every piece needs to be uh, planned, drafted, revised, and edited. But we want to make sure that students become uh, familiar with these processes and they're part of the, the way that in which they engage composing. And we want to encourage personal responsibility and student ownership for what they write. Now, when we do those things, there's about a 16 percentile point jump in terms of writing quality for kids. A second thing, and this one sometimes a little bit more controversial because there's two kind of basic approaches to writing. And the first one was kind of illustrated uh, with write, which is writing is caught. That the best way for students to learn to write is to have them engage in writing for real purposes, for real audiences, and do it frequently. And the assumption is they'll learn all that they need. Okay? The other way is that we should teach writing, that we need to explicitly do so, and that that will make sure that students learn all they need. I would argue that it takes both of these approaches if we want most students or all of our students to become good writers. So in terms of teaching, I'm going to share a couple of things that have been particularly effective. I'm not suggesting that these are all the things that we need to teach. But one of the things that's been really powerful, it's not just enough to help make sure that students plan. They engage in those cycles of processes, production processes, plan, draft, revise, and edit. They need strategies that are effective. And at least in the US, what we find is those strategies are most effective when they center around genre. So for example, one of the strategies that we've used with kids is we'll ask them if they're taking a position on a controversial topic to think about that controversial topic from each direction or every direction they can. Sometimes that's done individually, in pairs, small groups, or whole classrooms. Once they've done that talking and generating of ideas around that, then we ask them to take a position. And then they go back through the information that they've generated. They decide which ideas they're going to use to support their premise and which ideas they think are most important to refute. This will be around kids around 10 years of age. And then we encourage them to plan, to, to use their plan as they write and keep planning as they go. Now, that's a pretty straightforward and simple heuristic, ones in which we, when we think about planning something for persuasive writing, often engage in as well. And take a look at the percentile jump, 35 percentile jump in terms of writing quality for kids who learn how to be more planful, more evaluative, and more critical in terms of these processes. We also want to be sure that we teach sentence construction. Now, if I was to watch you write, I would say about 80 to 90% of your cognitive effort is actually at the sentence level. You have an idea that you're hanging around up here in your head. And what you have to do is you have to translate that into the right words, the right vessel to convey your intended meaning that is clear to the audience and hopefully will keep them engaged with your writing. So you might see why that's a bit of a challenging thing. And what we don't do is very much with this. We tend to focus in on grammar. Nothing wrong with that, OK? I'm not going to talk about grammar. I'm going to talk about sentence construction. But we need to help kids become more facile in this. So here's the thing. It's a double whammy on this. We do this with kids. 19 percentile point jump in writing quality. Reading fluency gets better as well. 
And the reason for that is because they learned the basic structures involved in syntax or sentence structure, and that provides them with more fluency as they read. Teaching vocabulary for writing. Look at that percentile jump. Now, we don't have as much research on this, but this can involve multiple ways of approaching this. One is um, we can teach what we call tier two words. These are words that are not so common and ones that are likely to be used in students' writing. And if we do that on a systematic basis like we do in reading, then there's usually a jump in terms of writing. It can involve teaching genre words. We had a study where we taught kids in fourth grade mystery writing. And the way we approached it was by teaching things like what's a red herring? You know, various aspects that you see in a mystery. And what we found was that when we taught those words, it dragged in information that's important to writing a mystery. And so not only did they learn that vocabulary, but their writing improved as well. It can also involve teaching words around content. So something like outer space. I might be doing a vocabulary unit on outer space, and then students are writing a story about outer space for me, an informational text, and also a persuasive text about why maybe we should go to the moon or Mars or wherever we may be headed next. So those would be some examples. Um, we want to teach transcription skills, handwriting and spelling. I know that these are not always the most fun things to teach, but they interfere with other writing processes until they become automatic. And so what we see is that when we teach these skills, not only do handwriting and spelling get better, but quality of writing gets better, particularly in grades one to three. And there's a huge jump in spelling, and we've also seen a jump in terms of reading comprehension. So another one of those kind of things where we get a double whammy. Um, we want to make sure that students learn more about writing. And so here, what we're really talking about, what are the purposes of different genres, and what are the basic structural elements? Remember that strategy I mentioned a little bit ago about persuasive writing? Sorry. Um, basically, what we were doing there is we were using the basic elements of a persuasive text, reasons and counter reasons, two of the basic elements, we were using those as a way to generate information and uh, being able to make sure that your, your composition included those. So when we use reading as our entry point into this, what we'll often do, for example, is we might read stories with kids. What we'll have them do is help us point out the basic elements in the type of story we're looking at, which often includes things like who the protagonist or main character is, where the story's set, when it takes place, What's a starting event that gets things rolling? What are the characters' intentions and goals? What happens? How does, how does that particular episode end? But once you know that information, then that's information you use as you write. Um, we also want to support students as they write. And I'm going to go a little faster here. We want to be clear about our writing goals for students. When we're clear about what we want students to do, guess what? we're much more likely to get it. If you want to have counter reasons in a persuasive text, you want kids to do, do that, tell them. They're much more likely to do it. A huge jump in writing quality. We want to encourage peers to work together around process, planning, drafting, revising, editing. But we want to make sure that we set up a structure for that. What we found is if we don't set up the structure, it's not very effective. Again, a very large jump in terms of quality. We want to support students before they actually put pen to paper through pre-writing activities, reading materials to gain information, you know, using a graphic organizer to help you organize and generate ideas are two examples of this. We also want to support students through feedback. Um, and what we know is that when teachers give feedback, there's a pretty large jump in terms of the quality of students' writing. This would also include peer feedback, which I don't have here. And when we teach students to self-assess their own writing, we get a large jump or a reasonable jump in writing quality. And we need to use 21st century writing tools. I'm going to leave it at that. You know, we're, we're still stuck in the 19th century, to be quite honest. Um, we want to connect reading and writing. And I would say reading, writing, and learning. 
And so what we know is that when you write about what you learn, there's a positive increase in terms of your knowledge of that information and understanding it. Guess what? When you write about what you read, same thing. When you teach writing, as we've already seen, and have kids write, they become better readers, and it goes in the opposite direction as well. Um, and we want to create a pleasant environment where students will take risk and also be motivated to write. And some action steps, uh, I'm just going to put that up there for a second because I want to leave a little time for questions and some more as my last point here. Doesn't matter what I say. You can be the best teacher in the world in terms of putting these things into place. But as a seven-year-old reminded us, there's many more things that make a great teacher. And I particularly like this. So this leaves me with a little bit of time. I'm not exactly sure how much, maybe about four minutes uh, for questions. And we'll, we'll test my ability to respond quickly, <laughs> which, as you know, academics Thank are not you. very good at. I was really fascinated by what you said about um, teaching, explicitly teaching transcription to sort of free up cognitive loads, allowing children to to demonstrate the other writing skills that they need to apply. What, have you got any sort of tips around strategies for how to do that effectively? Okay. Yeah, so um, we've done a number of studies. I'm going to pick spelling as, as the point because I think handwriting is a lot easier to teach. Um, one of the things that we always start with in, our, in the work we do in spelling is a word sorting activity. And what we'll try to do is use the word sorting activity to illustrate some common patterns or generalizations that exist in spelling, usually contrasting two or more patterns. So it might be like a, a long A and a short A sound, for example. And what we'll have is a series of cards that we'll initially model, you know, we'll have like a, a had and made as a card. So we have short A and long A here. And I might have a card, I don't know why bad's the only thing I can think of, but I might have a card like bad, and I'll model how I might put as a teacher this card here, getting the students to help me. And so as we go through the cards and placing them in their particular slots, so to speak, what we're doing is we're kind of isolating the sounds and talking about, you know, kind of the corresponding letters with the idea that increasingly students help me place the words where, where they, they should go. And as we're doing this, they're forming hypothesis about what the rule is. And they help generate the rule. Now, quite honestly, if they can't generate the rule, we don't keep it hidden from them. We say it right away. And then their practice on words or word building activities with the same patterns, sometimes learning words that are very common and also word hunting in their reading and other places um, you know, in life to find words like that. So that would be an example of something that my particular research team has done in terms of spelling. Um, good morning and thank you very much. I was absolutely delighted to see your last couple of slides where assistive technology enables children. Greg and I have worked quite a lot with uh, children with challenges in writing and reading because they can't. They can't hold a pen and they can't hold yeah. a book. And we've been looking at different ways that they can show their language and communications either on paper or oratory. Um, there's a big thing about writing and the process of writing and the cognitive ability for that. With our children, that's our cognitive overload. What would your ideas be to encourage those children who find reading and have to use a maybe a, a, a device to help them read? Are your blind children uh, are in this box as well as those that can't read for various reasons? What, how can we enable these children to be part of this conversation? So I, I really appreciate the question. There's no reason for you to know this. When I said I was a teacher before, I was a teacher with kids with special needs. Um, and so my initial work is all centered around that, and I still do work with kids in the U.S. that would be identified as having learning disabilities, behavior disorders, and we have several projects with kids who, are, who, who would be classified as deaf or hard of hearing. And so one of the things that I think is really important to point out is that many of the procedures that I talked about, or many of the principles that I talked about, apply pretty generally. A uh, second thing I'd like to point out is that, you know, basically what we see 
is every kid can move forward in their writing. Different kids will get in different places, just like some of you are better writers with poetry. Some of you are better writers in terms of expository text. But in terms of your question directly, I think one of the things that we don't take advantage of enough is the technology that's now available to us. And so, you know, that would be the place that I'd focus my strongest attention with those who have the strongest challenges in terms of communication through writing. And there's been quite a bit of research that's looked at that, particularly in the special education literature uh, within the US and outside. Thank you, Steve, very much. Thank you also for those questions. Um, yes, another clap is very, very, very welcome. Um,